Welcome everyone. In this talk, I will describe our efforts and progress in developing a practical QKD system entirely based on quantum photonic integrated chips. This work has been carried out at the Quantum Information Group of Toshiba Europe in Cambridge. The main problem that we want to address is the development of a technology able to sustain the deployment of QKD at large scale in order to provide quantum secure communications beyond niche applications. It's been already two decades since the first de experimental demonstration of QKD networks, starting from just a few nodes and short distances to links of increasing distances, now covering multiple cities or multiple states, and with increasing number of nodes. This is only going to expand even more with the recent introduction of satellite QKD links. Meanwhile, the development of coherent optical communications helped increasing the bandwidth of classical telecom and datacom networks. It is important to observe that if we look at the global population density, more than 50% of this population is within reach of the metropolitan and access networks. So if we want to provide quantum secure communication to as many clients as possible, we need to target these segments. That's not a simple story. Why? Because these networks have high connectivity, high density, and uh, deploying QKD in these networks directly pose, poses three uh, challenges, uh, three important challenges. First, coping with the high bandwidth. Second, overcoming uh, photon losses over long fiber links. And finally, reducing the cost of device, produ of device production, operation, and deployment. Beside potential solutions involving trusted relay nodes, multiplexing, higher clock rates, and new encoding methods, the main problem that we need to address is the volume production of QKD devices, their scalability, and we need to ensure their compatibility for deployment within coherent optical communication infrastructure. So how to address this question uh, in the context of quantum communications? If we look at uh, what was done in, in classical telecom and datacom, photonic integrated circuits have been a key enabling technology for high bandwidth devices. So it's, it's, uh, quantum photonic integrated circuits appear naturally as a very attractive candidate for this goal. Here, I refer the audience to this nice review published last year on integrated photonic quantum technologies. It reviews different photonic chips developed in uh, the last five years using different platforms such as silicon photonics or indium phosphide. The core QKD functions have already been demonstrated on chip with uh, quantum transmitters or QTX, quantum receivers or QRX. Uh, both implementing different protocols, and with QRNGs, uh, quantum random number generator chips, also based on different techniques. Here, I propose a little survey of realization of QKD transmitter chips over the last five years. For timing reasons, I will simply comment that most of these realizations did not operate in real time. We can also observe that QRNGs are missing from or, uh, from most of these works, and that the majority of these QKD transmitters still relied on external discrete optics, such as uh, diode lasers and intensity modulators. We can also see that uh, none, of, none of these works actually combine all these elements at once. As a result, despite successful demonstrations, a complete system is still missing. Uh, why is that? In fact, numerous challenges need to be tackled at once to demonstrate a system that is quantum secure, power efficient, and easily deployable. This requires to generate quantum, quantum random numbers at high bit rate to ensure that 
the phase modulation technique is power efficient and not too bulky on chip. This will also require to remove all lab equipment and replace it with compact driving electronics and uh, also processing electronics. So all this poses practical questions such as thermal management, power consumption, and it requires to design the optical circuits with the electronic circuits in mind. Further, system integration requires photonic packaging, optoelectronics assembly, and feedback routine for long-term operation. Finally, to be actually deployable, the system needs to generate the basis and state selection variables from the quantum random numbers in real time. Uh, the system needs to perform uh, error correction, privacy amplification, and it also needs to sustain data encryption. In the following, I'll describe how we developed a set of compatible quantum communication chips that execute the core QKD functions and how we perform their complete optoelectronic integration to demonstrate a fully standalone and deployable photonic integrated QKD system. So let's start with the quantum random number generator chip. As we know, quantum random numbers are essential to guarantee the, the information theoretic security in QKD. And that's because the choice of random bits, bases, and decoy state intensities need to be completely unpredictable to a eavesdropper. In addition, for most protocols based on weak coherent pulses, global phase randomization is an essential ingredient of the security proof. It allows the mapping of the density of states of weak coherent pulses onto that of a mixture or of uh, photon number eigenstates. Spontaneous emission phase noise at the onset of lasing is a very convenient source of quantum randomness. The main advantage is that it can be realized fairly easily using gain switch laser diodes, where the phase of a pulse is dictated by spontaneous emission phase noise, which in turn originates in vacuum fluctuations. Here we show uh, how to realize that with three different settings. Um, measuring interferences between successive pulses from a single laser using an asymmetric Maxander interferometer, or measuring interferences between two independent laser diodes with uh, either both gain switched or one gain switched and one in uh, CW. The intensity of the interference product com is completely random and can therefore be used to, uh, to extract the quantum random numbers. The circuit that we chose to implement is the one with two independent gain-switched laser diodes. On the photograph here, you can see such a QRNG chip. So it is fabricated on indium phosphide and has a footprint of two by six millimeters. Indium phosphide is convenient because it's an optical active uh, platform and we can, uh, we can integrate lasers directly on chip. So the chip features two DFB lasers followed by thermo-optic tunable Maxander interferometers that uh, serve as variable optical attenuators. Uh, one multimode interferometer where the pulses from both laser diodes are able to interfere. Uh, we also have a pin uh, diode for power uh, monitoring and an output uh, to an external photodiode for the measurement of the product of these interferences. The laser is uh, driven, the lasers are, are driven by binary RF signals and by adjusting the temporal delay between these signals it is possible to adjust the time overlap of these pulses. Using heaters on the laser diodes, it is also possible to adjust the spectral overlap and therefore to optimize the visibility of the interferences in the multimode interferometer. The results obtained with uh, such a chip were published two years ago. Uh, here we see the time-integrated waveform of the pulses at the output of the MMI. 
Uh, here we see a histogram of the intensities recorded uh, from uh, these waveforms. And we can see a double peak arc sign distribution, which is the typical signature of interferences with random phases. In addition, we measure the correlations between successive interference uh, pulses. And uh, we can see here that these correlations are negligible over a correlation distance up to uh, a microsecond or even more. We use this chip to demonstrate high bit rate uh, QRNG at 4 gigabit per second. It is interesting to see that for the BB84 protocol um, clocked at 1 gigahertz, this would be already sufficient to generate random variables for selections of the state, basis, and decoy intensities. Here we show that uh, the result of analysis, an analysis of a billion bits from this QRNG chip. Um, so we used uh, these bits to, uh, we submitted this bit to the NIST test battery and we proved that uh, the generated quantum random numbers successfully passed all randomness tests. Now let's move to the quantum transmitter chip. You can see a photograph of the chip here, as well as a diagram of the photonic circuit. The chip is fabricated in indium phosphide again, so that we can integrate all sorts of optically active components, such as lasers, photodiodes, amplifiers, intensity modulators, phase modulators, etc. The footprint is also 2 mm by uh, 6 mm. So we implement the time bean BB84 protocol with two weak coherent pulses in two time beans, split by 500 picoseconds. We encode information in four superposition states of the early and late pulses, as represented here in the equatorial state of the block sphere. So the X basis states are encoded with a relative phase of 0 and pi between the two time beams, and the Y basis states are encoded with a relative phase of pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. The global phase, which is the phase between successive pairs of coherent pulses, is completely random. As you can see on the circuit diagram, the circuit is uh, quite simple. It can be realized with only four binning blocks, two laser diodes, one VOA, and one electroabsorption modulator. And the reason why uh, this circuit is so simple is that we employ a technique called phase seeding which is essentially optical injection locking with phase preparation. So phase seeding is a very powerful technique to encode arbitrary differential states, uh, arbitrary different differential phases between two pulses without a phase modulator. This technique is reviewed in details in the review here to appear soon. And it was demonstrated two years ago on chip in this reference here. In a nutshell, phase seeding requires three very simple steps. Uh, step one, the first laser, uh, which we call the primary laser, is used to produce long gain switch pulses or seed pulses. Um, the pulses to be injected into a second uh, laser. In our case, the pulses are generated at a 1 GHz repetition rate and are roughly 800 picosecond long. After the initial relaxation oscillation, um, the phase of the gain switch pulse stabilizes to a fixed value. Uh, we represent uh, the phase here um, with the blue area below the pulse envelope. Step 2. Using direct current modulation of the primary laser, a short phase modulation is introduced in the middle of the long gain switch pulses. And uh, this has the effect of splitting the, the coherent region into two phase coherent regions, represented here in blue and red. The phase shift between both regions can be adjusted very accurately by acting on the amplitude and duration of this short current modulation. So we call such a pulse a phase encoded seed. 
The third step is the injection locking step. A secondary laser is again switched to produce short pulses, typically of 70 picosecond or even less. This time, the repetition rate is twice that of the primary laser, such that for each phase encoded uh, seed pulse entering the secondary cavity, one short pulse is generated in the early phase reference region, and a second pulse is generated in the late phase shifted region. The pulse pair, which would be completely incoherent in the absence of injection locking, now seamlessly inherits the coherence and the phase shift encoded in the phase encoded pulse. The capabilities of phase seeding are illustrated by these two experimental constellations of 8 and 16 lobes. We see that we can generate many more states than the four phase states needed for BB84, and therefore phase seeding has a potential for applications beyond uh, discrete variable QKD protocols, including, for instance, uh, CV QKD with discrete modulation, uh, but also advanced modulation formats in conventional coherent optical communications. Last, we generate decoy intensity states directly on chip using an electroabsorption modulator. We could have used a Maxander modulator for this. Uh, however, here we chose to prioritize the small footprint and the power efficiency of the chips. So, combined with phase seeding, there is no need for multi-level intensity modulation to generate the decoy and vacuum states. What we do instead is driving both the secondary laser diode and the EEM with binary on-off modulation. The approach is summarized in the table here. So uh, the top row shows the primary pulse injected in the, second, uh, the secondary laser cavity. So uh, if we want to generate a signal intensity state, we pulse the secondary laser and keep the EEM off. Uh, for a decoy state here, we pulse the secondary laser and uh, turn the EEM on as well. Uh, while for a vacuum state, the secondary laser is off and the EEM uh, can be on or, or off. With this approach, not only we keep the chip compact uh, and the power consumption low, we also simplify the drive electronics uh, by reducing the number of uh, multi-level modulations. So overall, we only need one multi-level signal, which is the one needed for the short modulation of the primary pulse. And uh, here, typically, we achieve a pi phase shift with modulations uh, of the order of 100, um, uh, 100 millivolts and uh, durations between 100 and 200 picoseconds. Our last chip is the QRX chip the QKD receiver. As opposed to the previous chips, this chip is realized on a passive platform. That's because we want to minimize the propagation losses, as I'll be explaining in a minute. The circuit is an asymmetric Maxander interferometer with a 500 picosecond delay line. Uh, we can see a photograph of the chip here. The circuit footprint is uh, 4 mm by 8 mm. Uh, the chip is uh, fully tunable, so, so if we look at the diagram, uh, the interferometer uh, is fully tunable with uh, thermo-optic uh, component. The input Maxander interferometer is used to balance the power at the output of the short arm and long arm, uh, account, uh, accounting for losses in the delay line. And the output Maxander interferometer is used to uh, is, is finely tuned to act as a perfect 50-50 beam splitter. In the short arm, a phase shifter is used to adjust the phase reference of the interferometer. Because the chip is fully passive, uh, we use an external phase modulator for the fast. Uh, modulation for the measurement basis selection. 
So the main challenge at the receiver is to mitigate the losses. Any loss at the receiver will correspond to a penalty in the range accessible by uh, the QKD system. So therefore, we need to select our material accordingly. For example, optically active materials can have losses between one and two orders of magnitude larger than the passive materials. Another aspect, another aspect to, to consider is that the bending radius that minimizes the bending losses uh, can range from 200 microns on active platforms and reach uh, a centimeter on passive platforms. So therefore, we need to select our material by looking at uh, the best trade-off between uh, total losses on chip and uh, the chip uh, dimensions, the chip footprint. So in this work, for packaging reasons um, that I'll be describing later, we wanted to keep the footprint low and uh, we chose to work with acceptable um, uh, insertion losses of the order of uh, 5 dB. So now that we have a set of QKD chips, we still need to make sure that they all work together in a standalone deployable system. For this, we need to address the questions of packaging, drive electronics, interface between chip, uh, between the different chips, uh, real-time operation, stability, and uh, interface with uh, encryption systems as well. Photonic packaging is essential to provide an electronic and optical interface between the chip and the outside world. Packaging also provides a mechanical protection to the photonic integrated circuits and means to control the chip temperature. For the QTX and QRX chips, we design a pluggable module in the CFP2 form factor so these packages are widely used in high bandwidth optical communications and um, the pluggable feature is uh, convenient because as soon as plugged into the host electronics, the module uh, is ready to use. So this not only makes maintenance of the system uh, much easier, it also ensures the compatibility of the same host electronics with successive generations of quantum peaks. We can therefore refine the designs of our circuits without the need of redeveloping the electronics. The QRX module was photographed here uh, as plugged in its cage, which features a heat sink, as, as you can see. So inside the module, we have a temperature sensor and a thermoelectric cooler uh, that are used to stabilize the temperature to uh, temperature fluctuations below 5 millicelsius degrees and this is in fact very important for uh, the phase stabilization. For the quantum random number generator chip which only requires two binary signals for the lasers and uh, some DC signals and only one um, optical fiber uh, then we simply selected a standard 14-pin butterfly package. Now let's take a look at the system design. Each QKD module is mounted on its own board, uh, as you can see here. So the QRNG board features the module, a high-speed photodiode, an ADC, uh, an analog to digital converter, and an FPGA. The board hosts both the drive and processing electronics for the quantum random numbers. The transmitter and receiver pluggable modules are uh, plugged directly uh, into their, their own uh, host boards, uh, which feature the drive electronics that generate the RF and DC signals for these chips. On the receiver board, we also have a, an external phase modulator that is used for the basis selection, as I explained previously. The RF signals are generated on the host boards based on digital inputs 
from the central FPGA core. Um, so this central board is used to translate the stream of random numbers from the QRNG board into patterns for uh, the prepare or measure um, variables for the uh, photonic qubit states. And this is all done in real time. Each unit is assembled into a compact one new rack mount, which is again um, very compact and uh, especially compatible with telecom datacom infrastructure. So you can see here the transmitter and receiver modules uh, plug into their respective units. So the FPGAs communicate with each other via optical signals. So we have uh, 10G SFPs here uh, for, for this communication. And um, uh, yeah, the FPGAs communicate for synchronization, sifting, feedback, etc. Besides the quantum hardware, we also have two servers that are used for real-time error correction and privacy amplification. Last, at the, at the receiver, uh, the single photons are detected using fast-gated APDs clocked at 1 GHz. In our work, we implement the T12 protocol with selection probabilities of uh, 15 over 16 for the X basis and 1 over 16 for both the um, decoy and uh, vacuum intensities. The system operates continuously without the need for user intervention um, using feedback uh, routines. So we are able to demonstrate stable operation over all metropolitan distances. One of the feedback routine is used to uh, adjust the phase of the, the transmitter with respect to uh, the measurement, the, the receiver measurement basis. Uh, the origin of uh, the fluctuations in, in phase are mainly due to uh, the, the thermal uh, fluctuations uh, and we correct them at each integration step. So in our case, every one megabit of uh, sifted uh, data um, uh, that we acquire. Our second feedback routines works on the temporal alignment. Um, and that's because uh, for, for long fiber, uh, for long optical fibers, we have a temporal drift uh, due to, um, uh, again, uh, thermal uh, variations of the optical length. So we correct the temporal alignment every, every time a QKD key uh, is generated. So this is after uh, privacy amplification on 94 blocks of uh, one megabit. The data shown here show up to 12 hours stable operation over real fibers of 0 km, 25 km and 50 km, just showing that our system is able to cover all metropolitan distances. Here we also see a full rate distance measurement of our system. So uh, we note that uh, we use very moderate APD efficiencies of 10% uh, in this work, and that was sufficient um, to cover metropolitan distances. Um, with APDs of uh, 25 to 30% efficiencies, which are um, readily available commercially, uh, the reach of our system would easily increase beyond 75 kilometers. To highlight the capability and performance of our system for operation under real conditions, we interfaced it with a commercial 100G data encryption system that uses AES-256 to encrypt data. We implemented our own key management API to serve PA keys, uh, privacy amplification keys, directly from our key stores to the 100G encryptor. So this is done in full compliance with the recent HC key management standards. We let our system run flawlessly for more than five days, 
over a 10 kilometer fiber link and uh, we measured a stable security rate of 470 kilobit per second which translated in the generation of enough material for over 1300 AES keys per second. So as we see uh, on the figure here, this rate was steady during the whole measurement duration. Uh, it should be noted as well that uh, we let the system run without any user intervention during all this time. So we see that the key material generated by the QKD system and, uh, is exceeds by far the one consumed by the commercial data encryption system. So this shows that our system can readily support many uh, commercial encry encryption devices at once. Um, now, if we want to uh, look further at, uh, for instance, at the one-time pad encryption, so our system would readily uh, sustain high fide fidelity audio communications and a small resolution uh, video conferencing. With this, we have reached the end of this talk. So in summary, I have shown you how we developed a set of quantum photonics chips and how we packaged them into plug and play modules. So we then saw how we uh, performed their uh, complete system integration in order to demonstrate a standalone QKD system, which is fully deployable and able to operate in real time over all metropolitan distances. The system was finally used to serve a commercial high bandwidth data encryption system for over five days without the need for any user intervention. So this work not only demonstrates the viability of photonic integration for quantum applications, it also opens a practical pathway to the wide-scale deployment of QKD in a plug-and-play power efficient way, which is fully compatible with existing communication infrastructure. Thank you very much for your attention.